Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, into the one and only Straight Facts, homie. My name is Mason Souza. Alongside, as always, there's Walter Sabina, John Lyons, and you see another man, a guest of guests. Uh, the past seven years, we've done Straight Facts, homie. We've usually said we've got a lot to get to in a limited time. Uh, forget everything I said in the past, because that's an understatement. Who we have here is Mr. Eric DaCosta, General Manager, Executive Vice President of the Baltimore Ravens football team, but maybe even more importantly than all that, Born and raised, born and bred in Taunton, Massachusetts. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here, sir. How are you? I'm doing good, guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you here. You must be uh, an expert at these virtual meetings at this point since, you know, I went on the Ravens YouTube page. It seems like there's six of them with your face in the past week. So can, can yeah. you teach us a thing or two about this? Well, it's basically adapt or die. And, you know, we've been forced because of the COVID-19 to stay in communication and run effectively an NFL draft. So we had to figure out all the technology and really get pretty adept at it as quickly as possible with our scouts and coaches, everybody on the same page. And then since the draft, we've done a lot of different media requirements and conference calls with suite holders and different people, different groups, trying to get everybody connected to talk about the organization, to spread the message and just to kind of keep everybody united. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, obviously it's it's incredibly unprecedented as as we all know at this time, and you got to adapt. Um, let me let me start with a fun one, real quick. Um, was it 1989? I mentioned Taunton, Massachusetts. Was that your graduation year? Yeah, 1989. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. When I, when I see the, when I say the quote, "Let's play like crazed dogs," what comes to mind? Well, that was Lawrence Taylor. And I got that off of NFL Films, and I believe that was probably my uh, my motto in the uh, 1989 yes, yearbook at Taunton yes, High School. It, yes, it was. Yep. Go ahead, Walter. All right, Eric. Thank you for uh, for doing this uh, as a resident of Taunton. I like to uh, kind of get to the roots of you, and I know you got a short time, so I'll get right to it. Uh, your head coach when you were at Taunton High, uh, Mr. Bob Lane. Um, you know, great football coach. Nothing but good things that people say about him. Um, when he passed away in 2011, the track was named after him and you had nothing but good things to say about him. What was it about Bob Lane? What was your relationship with, with Bob that, you know, he gave us such a good personality and, you know, had a heart of gold. Yeah. You know, I mean, he really did. Uh, he's like a second father to me and a guy that uh, when I think about my experiences growing up as a teenager, uh, coach Lane is probably right at the forefront of, of everything that uh, was important to me as a coach, you know, as a person that could take a bunch of young men and instill in us things like integrity and work ethic, uh, teamwork, uh, you know, desire, things like that. You know, uh, that's important. I think for young men, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, having those kind of mentors is critical. And I think Coach Lane for me really was probably other than my parents, the biggest mentor that I had. And, uh, you know, I think what he did with the football team as an educator, he touched many, many, many people's lives. Very, very, very selfless, unbelievable work ethic, extremely generous, heart of gold, very feisty, very competitive, no doubt about that. Uh, opinionated, outspoken. But if he was on your side, probably the greatest friend, the greatest ally that you could have. He loved Taunton, he loved Taunton High School. He loved his students. He loved the players that played for him. And he was definitely a unique personality that I'll never forget. Great. Oh, Go ahead, John. Yeah, Eric, that's, I mean, just getting into some, I know we have limited time, some Ravens and some NFL football. You mentioned on um, the Ravens YouTube page, your draft review, that when you come up to a pick, there's usually five or so guys that you're looking at potentially to take with that pick. And what I want to know is what do those five guys really have in common? You know, what are some traits across the board that you're going to look for in a football player to add to your team? Well, they've got to play fast. They've got to be aggressive players. They've got to be a productive, instinctive. They've got to be guys that when you watch the tape, you can watch 10 plays and they show up. They don't disappear. Uh, you know, their efforts got to be consistent. They've got to seem like they're playing faster than anybody else, more explosive uh, than anybody else. They've got to be dependable. They've got to have durability. They've got to be intelligent football players. And they've got to play like Ravens, which is something that we – started saying back probably around 2006, 2007. And that's just the description that we use when we see a player that plays with a competitive desire. Uh, to me, that signifies what our guys play like. And those are the types of guys we want. 
Yeah, and just to follow up on that, in this year's draft, uh, you took 10 players, and your roster going into the draft, I think, was the 17th by average age uh, in the NFL. So how do you gauge you know, how many young players maybe in a given year you want to add? Certain years you might want to add more, add fewer. You know, Kind of at what point do you say, hey, we want to add you know, 10 young guys. You know, We already have core guys that are young, but we want to improve those positions and, and kind of go from there. Yeah, well, I think it goes back to kind of how, uh, you know, I was raised growing up in Massachusetts, being a huge Red Sox fan, huge Celtics fan. I think of the Celtics in the 80s, and they were good every single year. There was no window with the Celtics. They were always the team to beat. And I was just so fascinated by that, by the way they were able to keep that team together, the continuity, the types of players that they had, the influx of young players all the time. And so for me, you know, people talk about windows being open and closed. That's not something that I really subscribe to. And I want to have a great mix of veteran players, but also young players at all times. So always having a lot of draft picks, eight, nine, ten draft picks every single year, acquiring extra picks, bringing in players so that we have a great mix of experience, but also youth. And I think that if you can do that, you create a great mixture, a cocktail of experienced guys who can provide leadership and perspective, but also young, explosive, fast, talented young players who have the chance to reach that same level as your veterans do. On, uh, on draft day itself, I had a little theory. We, we talked about it on the past episode on the show, Straight Facts Homie. Um, I was thinking because of the whole pandemic, what's going on in the world, things were limited. There were less um, uh, face-to-face meetings. You I believe that, you know, you don't really get to see like an intangible of a, uh, of a prospect uh, without seeing them face to face. So I had the theory, like in two, three, four years from now, we're going to look at this 2020 virtual draft and be like, wow, there were a lot more misses than usual because you couldn't get the full spectrum of who exactly you wanted. Were, were you concerned about that at all? Or were you confident in, in all the picks you made this past weekend? Well, this draft actually, you know, it, it kind of harkened back to my early drafts with the Ravens back in 96, 97, really before the, uh, the onset of the internet as we now know it in the influx of information and things like that, when we basically just focused on our scouts, uh, the evaluation of the players, and the information that we got from the area scouts. And so I think this year, the teams that will thrive this year in the draft are the teams that have outstanding experienced area guys that go into colleges, get information, build profiles, and then really the tape. And so I spent a lot more time this spring, especially when I came back home for the last four or five or six weeks, really just sitting back and watching players. So, uh, and that's how we used to do it. You know, I don't know that people really understand that, you know, this rise of information has really only been probably you know, about the last 15 years. And so over my 25 years with the club, uh, we never had a lot of that information. We didn't have all these mock drafts. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have the internet and all those types of things. All the statistical resources that we have nowadays, PFF, all those types of things. We watched the tape and we trusted our coaches and scouts. And um, that's what we did this year. Yeah, and to follow up on that, you mentioned how you know, today there's a lot more information available. And how do you balance, you know, I guess in a more regular year, how do you balance all this influx of, you know, analytics, more data and more video with just, hey, what do I see on tape with this guy? Is he, you know, is he the real deal or not? How do you balance that out? Well, it's like a big mosaic. So, you know, it's just all these different data points that, on draft weekend kind of converge together. You take all the different things, you figure out what's most important to you. You've got your uh, ideal profile of what a player should look like in your mind. Um, And then you find guys that most closely sort of resemble that profile. And you do it watching the tape, interviewing players, uh, building a, a background by talking to sources at the school personality profiling, intelligence testing, physical testing, and things like that that take place at the combine. The uh, medical aspect, the physical that we give the players, all those types of things. And it all kind of just joins together. And you find the guys that you most like. And obviously it's a draft process, so there is a frustration, but sometimes you really like a guy and he gets picked. 
but we're, we typically have always been a best player available team. Uh, we look at the best player available as we're on the clock and we're going to select that guy. And we've had the most success using that sort of tactic. It works for the Baltimore Ravens. Every team is a little bit different, but we feel that works best for us. Yeah, I believe you guys, you guys conquered that well the last, say, two drafts in the last three years. Um, obviously, being from Taunton, Massachusetts, Patriots fan, not going to lie, but um, I wanted the Patriots to get up there instead of Sony Michelle, take Lamar Jackson. Uh, you guys take him. This past draft, Patrick Queen was there. He drops to 28, absolutely best player available. You did that there, possibly the next Ray Lewis. Um, I had a couple more draft questions, but speaking of Ray Lewis, I'll just get to this one. Uh, obviously, an inspirational, inspirational man. Whenever he speaks, he inspires many all around. Was there ever a time like you were privy to, directly or indirectly, when Ray has one of his speeches and you're just looking around like, what is this guy saying? This guy, this speech kind of fell flat. You ever have a situation like that with Ray? No, nah, you know, um, I've been fortunate to be around Ray Lewis many, many times. And he has a charisma about him that's infectious. And I think people, his teammates especially, really feed off that. Uh, tremendous leadership, but even more so based on how he played. He was a guy that had a tremendous passion to make every single play, take on blockers. He's a guy that would play with injuries many, many times. He's a guy that fought through injuries and was basically unblockable for most of his career. So I think he's got a great perspective on overcoming adversity, I think, and becoming the best he can be. He's a guy that has a very, I think, important message for young people. He's done a tremendous amount of positive work in the community for Baltimore. And, uh, you know, he's probably the best I've ever seen. You know, linebacker, I have to say, and I've been around some great players here. You know, been fortunate to be around offensive linemen like Jonathan Ogden and, and Ed Reed, Hall of Famers, probably Marshall Yonder someday as well, offensive guard. But I got to say, if I think about the very best football players I've ever seen, probably Ray Lewis would be right there at the top for, for me personally. And, you know, Eric, you talked about the draft being a mosaic, and you just talked about how Ray Lewis kind of, inspired a lot of guys around him. One thing that a lot of coaches say is difficult to measure when they bring a player in is, is this guy going to buy in, right? And fully get on board with everything we're doing. So how do you measure or try to get a sense of, okay, if I sign this free agent or I pick this guy in the draft, is he going to come in and be bought in and be, you know, like you said earlier, play like a Raven? How do you try mm -hmm. to gauge that? Well, you gauge it in a lot of different ways. I mean, one way you gauge it is by watching the guy play. And over time, if you watch enough tape, you see certain qualities, characteristics that that player has. Uh, you can gauge things like work ethic. You can gauge things like football instinct, uh, eth uh, you know, eth motor, things like that by watching the tape. But another big way you can gauge those types of things is by talking to people, by talking to coaches that coached him, by talking to the trainers, the strength coaches, academic people at the school. You also can gauge that by actually talking to the player. And that's something that our scouts work on all the time is developing their interview skills. And there are specific things that we're looking for, specific words, body language. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, gauge things like growth mindset, grit, uh, ability to overcome adversity, self-awareness, things like that that all provide a glimpse into really who the player is. And it's obviously not a science, it's an art, but I think over time, if you really adhere to those types of things, you'll make more good decisions than bad decisions. Yeah, and you know, when you talk about you know, player movement, bringing guys in, and, and when a player, a significant player moves, like for example, this year, you know, Tom Brady leaves the AFC or last year, Odell Beckham joins the AFC. And obviously there's player movement all the time, but when you see a significant player move in and out of the conference or in and out of your division, how much does that change your calculus as what you're looking for in the upcoming season? Or is it, does it not change it at all? You know, I think we're really just focused on our team, you know, who we are as a team. We don't really concern ourselves very much with the opponents. You know, uh, it's a long season. It's a long year. Things change week to week and day to day. So we're just trying to focus on Coach Harbaugh and his coaches. They're really trying to focus the players on being the best that they can be 
every single day. What's important now? Every single day when they show up at the facility, how best are they going to prepare? How best are they going to train? What can they do to be the very best that they can be? We can control that message. We can control that day to day. We can't really control our opponents, who's playing, who's not playing, you know, all those types of things. Uh, speaking of players moving, um, I got to get to this one. Uh, Antonio Brown, obviously he was with the Patriots for a hot minute um back in week two this past season but uh his name seems to come up every week uh he posted a photoshop on snapchat of him in a baltimore ravens uniform uh is that just antonio being antonio or would you like to break some news right here right now for everyone huh. well you know there's a lot of players out there right now available on the streets and we've got a great player personnel staff so you know i think we have a long time to make decisions we love our team right now we've got a lot of really, really talented football players, and also some very good young wide receivers that we feel really strongly about. Um, I think that we're in a great position at some point to be ready for the season, whenever that season might be. We're always looking at players, and we're always able to adjust on the fly should we need to add additional players. But at this point, based on where we are, based on the time of the year, where we think we're going to get to, we love our team. We're very, very happy with the roster at this point, and we are prepared and very excited to move forward. Uh, one more for me real quick, Walter. I know you have a couple, yep. but um, speaking of players on your team, obviously Lamar Jackson, I want to take you back real quick to the day before you were, fit, you were officially named general manager, January 6th, I believe it was 2019. Obviously it didn't end well for the Ravens in the wild card game. Lamar had a tough day at the office. He figured it out late, but a little too late. Um, playoff Joe Flacco was on the bench. Maybe he could have caught fire and like he did in 2012 to, uh, yeah, I believe it was 2012. Who would, who knows? Maybe, but I personally believe I'm wondering what you, uh, think about this sticking with Lamar in that game. Maybe confidence is the wrong word because he's the quarterback taking the first round. I'm sure he has all of that, but maybe the assurance and the, like the ride or die commitment from the team, like, okay, this team has my back through thick or thin. And I believe that's is not the only factor, but I believe that's one of the main factors why he actually had the MVP season he had last year. What would you say to that? Well, I mean, Lamar's got a great work ethic, and he's very, very hard on himself, and he worked his ass off this year to be the best he could be. I think that has more to do with that than anything else. Um, we added some players around him. When you add players like Mark Ingram, for instance, you know, uh, some of the other players that we did, we had three excellent tight ends, a very strong offensive line. So I think we were able to build a great nucleus of players. And you're never only as good as, with one player as you are with 11 guys all pulling together. Lamar is very, very hard on himself. And uh, he's a smart guy, highly, highly motivated. He's driven to succeed. He's got leadership ability. He's supremely talented. And we're just happy that we have them. I think Coach Harbaugh and his staff, Greg Roman, James Urban, our quarterbacks coach, did an awesome job with Lamar. But we're not there yet. You know, uh, we've got a lot of work to do. And I think we recognize that as players, as a front office, as a coaching staff. And our job is to keep pushing forward to add as many good players as we can to build the best team we can, best team of players that we can so we can achieve what we've achieved twice, which is to say the Super Bowl. Well, I tell you what, 14-2 and two last season, uh, Ozzie Newsom didn't do that in his 20-plus uh, years as the lead guy. So do you ever rub that in Ozzie's face? Like, hey, you didn't have a regular season like nah, I did. Nah, nah. You know, Ozzie's a legend. I mean, he's the goat. He's the goat, you know. I mean, that guy's a Hall of Fame tight end, and in my mind, a Hall of Fame front office executive. Not many people can say that. And I'm still learning from Ozzie every single day. Uh, his humility, his patience, his work ethic, his passion, his intelligence. He is the very best, and I am blessed. I've been blessed over 24 and a half years to work with him, and I could think of nothing better than to work with him for another 24 years. And speaking of Ozzy, I assume, obviously, you've taken a lot of Ozzy's program into what you do you know, now with the Ravens, given that you were part of it for so long. Um, is there anything, though, that you know, since you've kind of taken over that maybe you've gone in not a totally different direction but done a little bit differently? Uh, per se than when Ozzy did it or have you just tried to keep everything kind of flowing the way it was? I uh, know I mean I think you'd be foolish to keep doing the same thing every single year you've got to adjust and we do that we've been doing that over 24 years 
you keep changing, you keep self scouting, you keep analyzing what works and what doesn't work and find better ways to do things. And so, you know, we'll continue to do that. I mean, certainly not everything that I do is great and we've got to continue to improve based off of that as well. So every single year is truly a new year. Uh, we never rest. We're never satisfied where we are. We're always evaluating who we are as a front office, as a coaching staff, as a locker room of players, trying to get the best team we can as quickly as possible so that we can, can compete with teams like the Patriots. Um, before we get to a couple more time questions to wrap this up and bring it home back to uh, your native town or native city here, um, I'm wondering uh, how are you and your peers around um, about the possible, there's a theory going around or, or the thoughts of if, you know, what's going on in the world doesn't get cleaned up, doesn't get better in the next month or two about the possibility of NFL games being either delayed or without fans in the stand. Have you heard anything like that? What's, what's the belief going on in, in your inner circle among, among what's going on with that? I haven't really talked about that. I mean, obviously you think about it, you know, but as, a, as an organization, we're focused on today. We're focused on being the best team we can. We'll let the future kind of dictate what happens. But my goal right now is to make sure we have as many guys as possible in our virtual off-season program. I want to make sure that our scouts are doing everything they can to get all the information about these players next year. I want to make sure that our nutritionists and trainers and doctors, our science people, performance, uh, community relations, everybody's pulling in the same direction. Everybody understands what the mission is, how we get there, and that's what we're really focused on right now. I just want to, uh, I want to bring it back to uh, 1989, your senior year of high school. Um, look at your, your yearbook post um, in your memories. Um, anyone that's played high school football has some sort of memory, but this one you managed to put in your memories. Uh, the memory of Coach Lane throwing your helmet. Can you uh, kind of expand on uh, that story a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I, I forget who we were playing now. Um, you know, it might have been uh, one of the Weymouth teams. Um, you know, Weymouth South or Weymouth North, I can't remember, but we were having a bad first half. And we all just came in at halftime, kind of all sit down, take a knee, whatever it was. I was close to Coach Lane, and he was just furious with the team. It wasn't anything direct towards me, but he picked up my helmet by the face mask and just whipped it across the, uh, the locker room, which was underneath the stands over there. Yeah and smashed into a concrete wall and my ear pads were flying out. And so uh, then we had to get out and get on the field, but I was delayed because I couldn't find my left ear pad because it had fallen someplace. And so I'm trying to get all my equipment ready, um, but he motivated us and we came back and won that game. And that was something that coach Lane could do better than anybody. He had an uncanny ability for pushing all the right buttons and getting us to all kind of head in the right direction. Yeah, Mr. Matos, uh, the the man who uh, connected us, uh, headmaster at Tan High, uh, also, yeah, I'm sure he has he has a million Bobby Lane stories. He was interested interested about that as well. He also wanted the uh, big props to wearing um, a Taunton Tiger uh, pre draft shirt, I believe you sent to him. So representing Taunton, even yeah, even yeah, big big man you are now. <laughs> oh, I love Taunton. Uh, you know, I still have family that lives there. And so many, 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 many fond memories. Some of my best friends still live there. Uh, Johnny Montero, for instance, he's a fireman. Great, great dear friend of mine. Um, you know, there's just people that I, you know, when I think about myself, I think a big part of my identity and how I define myself as being from Taunton. So, uh, you know, it's a great town. I think that uh, it really does instill the right type of qualities in you to succeed in life, work ethic hard work, blue collar mentality, achieving, working hard, staying together, family, those types of things that I really, really strongly believe in. And I was fortunate to grow up there. And I think about going back, getting up there all the time. It's not very easy anymore for me um, with my lifestyle that I have, but it's a special place and, uh, and very special to me personally. Well, you represent it very well. Last one for me, if you guys have any other questions in the interest of time. I'm curious, uh, are the owls still outside your window or was uh, that just a draft day thing? No, they're still out there. I haven't seen them this morning, but they're out there early in the morning. And, uh, you know, so the they, police, uh, the police actually believe they could have been like robotic drones. 
or something like well, that. No, they're just kidding. But they, oh. <laughs> but they looked so. Uh, it's just amazing to see those two guys um, like that sitting right there next to the police. We had state police in my driveway for four days just to make sure that everything was taken care of during the draft and the, the infrastructure, the technology and the Wi-Fi and all that stuff. So, but they took the picture of those guys. I hear those guys all the time, but uh, it was unbelievable to actually see a picture that clear of those two guys. And so the joke was that it was somebody uh, trying to spy to get a copy of my draft board. Well, yeah, I don't want to say any names, but, you know, maybe someone in New England. But, uh, uh, John, Walter, any more questions before? Uh... Just one more question for me, Eric. Obviously, um, you have a job that a lot of people aspire to have being a GM of an NFL team, and, and everyone sees the glamour and the success in that. But what's something maybe about that job or some things that a lot of people maybe don't know about or that you didn't expect when, when you first got it? I mean, you know, it just, it really is. It's, it can be uh, a very sort of time consuming, very routine job. And it's, uh, it takes hard work. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in a dark room watching football players uh, over and over and over again. It's like, kind of like when I was working for Taunton Parks and Recreation um, and I would be cutting every day, you know, it was like Groundhog Day, cutting all the grass, all the baseball fields, Whittington, Hartsons, where, the where, all those fields every single day train me and that's kind of what it's like at times you get up early in the morning you're in that dark room you turn the projector on you start watching football every single day so i think there's a beauty in that doing the same things over and over and over and over again but you've also got to have the discipline i think to do that and i like to think my background and taunt and kind of help me with that definitely taking the blue collar taunton to uh to where you are now and you know obviously everyone here in taunton in southeastern massachusetts is incredibly incredibly proud of uh where you've come and we're we're incredibly honored to have you on eric we really appreciate it uh much continued success um i mean i have two more papers of of questions if you want to do this a yearly thing that's totally up to you it would be it would appreciate uh taunton and the folks very well but again we, we appreciate it so much and continued success well guys i appreciate it thank you so much for having me on and uh best of luck take care of that city Taunton High School, very, very special to me. Um, and all the best to you guys. We will. You as Thank well. You. Thank you. Yeah, Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye.